Hello and welcome to Life from Above. My name is Ralph Price. I'm the preacher for the Streetsboro Church of Christ and I appreciate the opportunity to be with you uh, today. Previously, I have given a lesson about the idea of our responsibility to the lost. Going on with uh, our gospel meeting and the different topics that were covered, we also wanted to focus in on our responsibility to the Word. I want to read a poem to you that many of you have probably heard before. It says, Last eve I paused beside the blacksmith's door and heard the anvil ring the vesper chime. Looking in, I saw upon the floor old hammers worn with beating years of time. How many anvils have you had, said I, to wear and batter all these hammers so? Just one, said he, and then with twinkling eye, the anvil wears the hammers out, you know. And so I thought the anvil of God's word for ages skeptic blows have beat upon. Yet though the noise of falling blows was heard, the anvil is unharmed, the hammer's gone. Friend, over the years, centuries and skeptics have scoffed at and mocked God's word. There have been numerous claims over the centuries that God's word would be gone within a certain amount of time, and yet God's word is still here, and those skeptics are all gone. Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 24 and 25, All flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Yes, the word of the Lord endures forever. It's still true. God's word will abide forever. God's word will be powerful forever. It will always be relevant. It will always be important. And it will always lead us to salvation. And so let's think about a little bit our responsibility to the word of God. First of all, and I have three points. First of all, we have a responsibility to love it. We have a responsibility to love it. And I ask, what is it that is not to love? about the Bible. In the Bible, we have our Creator revealed to us. In Genesis 1 and verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Think about all the time and all the effort that man has put into scientific study to try to determine the origins of our universe and all the mental anguish that has been applied to the idea of where did we come from and how did we get here and yet the Bible tells us very plainly how we got here and from whence we come. Not only does it tell us from whence we have come, but it also tells us where we are going. Also, think about that great question that people have. Well, what happens after death? What, do we just cease to exist or is there some kind of afterlife? Friend, the Bible answers that question for us. The Bible is a light that God has given us to guide our paths. Psalm 119, 105, David said, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It can guide us through the trials and struggles of life, through the tough moral decisions that we have to face on a daily basis. And, and we, can, we should love it for that. The Bible is capable of cheering us up when we're down. We can read about such men as Job or David who went through great struggles in their life, but in the end, God saw them through and blessed them uh, in a great way. It can cheer us up when we're down, but also conversely, it can bring us down when we get a little bit too big for our britches uh, and we need to be humbled a little bit. God's word can certainly do that to us as well and remind us uh, that we too, are human. We too make mistakes and there is always room for improvement. The Bible tells us of God's love for us. It tells us about Jesus who left heaven, who came to earth and lived as a man and died on the cross for our sins. It, it tells us of the wonderful example that he has set for each and every one of us in his life on how to live it tells us of His words which He has given to guide us and again to serve as a light to our path. And, in, and it tells us of his, his death on the cross that makes our salvation possible. You know, I say, what is it about the Bible that is not to love? I, I know that a lot of people choose not to love the Bible because 
the Bible tells them that they ought to live and behave in a certain way and they don't like being told that. But we ought to rather rejoice in the fact that the Bible does lay down a blueprint for us and tell us how we ought to live our lives because the commands that the Bible gives us are for our own good. In 1 John 5 and verse 3, we read, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. Certainly, as if we try to live faithfully to God's Word, there are certain things that we maybe can no longer do that we used to do, but we understand that those commands are for our own good, and in the long run, they make our lives much better. As parents who, who raise little children, we know that sometimes we forbid them certain things, and that child might not understand why they can't have candy for supper, breakfast, and lunch every day, but we as their parent understand and we know that that would not be good for them. And in the same way, our Heavenly Father knows that some things, some behaviors, some choices will get us into trouble down the line, even if maybe we don't possess the wisdom to see that. God does. And so He warns us about those things. His commands are not burdensome. Paul would write in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 8, Bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. In other words, Paul says there, Godliness is profitable in this life and the next. In this life, obedience to the commands of God helps us to be happier, healthier individuals. I look around at the mess that some people get their lives into when they are not obedient to the Word of God. And it saddens my heart to know that, you know, if they had just taken the time or if someone had taken the time to teach them what the the Scriptures teach on, on such a topic, that they would not have gotten themselves into the trouble that they're in. And so we need to develop an appreciation. We need to develop a love for the Word of God and what it can do for us so we need to love it number two though we need to learn it we need to learn it first of all we need to learn about it what do i mean by that when i say we need to learn about it i'm saying maybe do we need to learn what it says yes absolutely and we're going to talk about that in a moment but we need to learn about it we need to know how to uh, answer questions about the bible when we love something we and we're interested in something, we take the time to learn more about it, don't we? You think about an an individual who is a a sports fanatic. Maybe we would call them a mega fan. You know, this individual will know more about a given team than just, you know, their record or who they're playing that week. They will uh, read anything they can on the topic. They will increase their knowledge so that they can have conversations with other people about that topic. They may know the players. They may know about the players' hobbies and interests. They may know, um, you know, the schedules in the upcoming years and, and everything about that team. And, and they know those things because they love that team or they love that sport. Nobody has to tell them, you need to study that sport. You need to become an expert in that field. They don't need to be encouraged because they love it. And if we love and appreciate God's Word we're going to take the time to learn about it. What do I mean by that? Well, we need to know how to answer questions about God's Word. You know, uh, in our efforts to reach out and teach people, we may come across such questions as, where'd the Bible come from? How did we get it? Who wrote it? When was it written? You know, do we know how to answer that question about the inspiration of the Scriptures and how God... Um, through the Holy Spirit, inspired people to write, and those writings were collected and, and passed down through the ages? Do we understand how to answer those questions? Do we, as Christians, do we know the Bible? Do you know the books of the Bible? Do you know how to go to and find a scripture? And have you applied parts of that Bible to your memory so that even if you don't have a physical copy or a digital copy nowadays, you, you have access to that, that scripture because you've committed it to memory. Again, and with things we love, we do that all the time. I have a daughter who, who can sing songs and, and seems like she only hears them one time and she remembers all the lyrics to those songs. 
Uh, we can commit scripture to our memory if we love it and we want to, and we devote the effort to doing that. Can we answer such questions as, what makes the Bible different from the Quran? Or what makes the Bible different from the Book of Mormon? Do we know the difference? Can we answer questions like, how do we know that the Bible really is from God? Or, how do we know that the Bible hasn't been corrupted over the thousands of years that have passed since it was originally written? We need to learn about God word, God's Word, and we need to learn to answer those questions if we're going to be effective. Because I've found more and more that in our efforts to teach the lost, before we can start teaching them about Jesus and about sin and about salvation, we first have to teach them about God's Word. We have to convince them that the Bible is our authority and that the Bible is, is the book to which we must go to learn. So not only, though, do we need to learn about it and how to answer those questions, we also need to learn it. We need to study the Bible and know what it says. The Word of God is capable of, of saving us. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 32, Paul said the following, Brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Paul says that to the uh, Ephesian elders and says, I commit you to God's word that's able to build you up or strengthen you and to give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. God's word is, is capable of saving us. God's word is capable of setting us free from the guilt of sin, John 8 and verse 32. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. God's word can sanctify us. In John 17 and 17, Jesus said, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth as he was praying to the Father. What does sanctify mean? It means to cleanse. It means to purify it comes from the same root word in the Greek as the word for holy. It makes an individual holy or sets them apart for a divine purpose. The Word of God is able to do that. The Word of God can build us up. It can guide us. It can do all of these things, but it can only do those things if we know what it says. If we take the time to study it and learn it. In 1 Timothy, or excuse me, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15, Paul said, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We need to devote diligent study to God's word so that we can know it, so that we can enjoy the blessings that it offers, salvation and, and the guide for our life that it, it has for us. We need to be like those noble Bereans that we read about in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11. It says in regard to them, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. As Paul was preaching to them in Berea, it says they received them. They received the things that were spoken by Paul. In other words, they, they were ready to listen, but they didn't just automatically believe everything that Paul had to say. They went to the scriptures and studied on a daily basis to make sure that the things that Paul was saying were indeed true. And that's the type of mentality, the type of effort that we need to apply to God's Word. We have so many individuals who have allowed themselves to be led astray by false teachers in the world today, and that primarily stems from the fact that they've never developed a love for God's Word, and as a result, they don't know about it, and they don't really know what it says, but they simply trust the preacher to teach them what God's word says. Friend, if that describes you, then you're, you're putting yourself at the mercy of your preacher. And you're putting yourself at the mercy of your preacher and whether or not he's teaching the truth and whether or not he's taking the time to actually learn the truth and deliver it to you. And all too often, uh, as is the case, preachers don't teach the truth. They teach that which is untrue, and they lead many astray in that way. Growth and knowledge uh, in the Word of God, it takes time. There, you know, we obey the gospel. We learn what we have to do for salvation, but then the growth process just begins. 
it takes a lifetime of study. And, uh, you know, I know individuals uh, who have been Christians for decades, 50, 60 years, and, and they'll always say, you know, it, it's amazing to me how even though I've studied the Bible all these years, it always has more to teach me. Every time I read it, I find new things that I missed before that I can apply to my life. Are you learning the Bible as you should? Do you love it and are you learning it? Or are you like those Hebrews that the Hebrew writer describes in Hebrews 5 and verse 12 when he said the following? He said, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. You see, there comes a time when a person has been a Christian long enough that they ought to, they've had time to study and to learn God's will and to learn about the Word. They ought to be teachers. But all too often, that's not the case. The growth is not there because the love for God's Word is not there. And therefore, they don't grow in knowledge. And they still have need to be taught and reminded what the Scriptures say because they don't, they don't love it. Our responsibility to the Word is to, number one, love it, number two, learn it, and then number three, and just as important as the other two, we need to live it. We need to live it. Knowing what God's Word says is important. But you know, that by itself is not alone, not, uh, by itself is not enough. There are many in the world who are professed atheists who know what the Bible says. They've taken the time to read it, and um, sometimes these, these atheists might know the Word of God, unfortunately, better than some who claim to be Christians. But the Word of God does them no good because they're not living it. They're not obeying the teachings therein. We also have to obey the Word. As we said, the Word can, it can save us. It serves as a guide for us. It sanctifies us. It sets us free from the guilt of sin. But we have to learn it, and then we have to live it. We have to obey it. In terms of salvation, we have to obey it. What does God's Word say in regard to salvation? It says, well, it says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Romans ten seventeen. Jesus says, uh, that we'll die in our sins if we don't believe that He is the I Am in John 8 and verse 24. We have to believe in Jesus to have salvation. The Scriptures tell us in Luke 13, 3 and, and other passages that there is a need for repentance or turning from sin in order to have salvation. Romans 10, 9 and 10 tells us that with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. There is a need for us to confess our faith in Christ and then last but not least, there is a need to be baptized. Mark 16, 16, Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Um, the, those, those steps are there in God's Word. It tells us what to do to be saved from our sins. But again, it won't do us any good if we don't do it, if we don't live it and obey what it teaches. Hebrews 5 and verse 9 tells us, in regard to Jesus, it says, Having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all. But the verse doesn't stop there. It says he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Friend, God's word can save you from your sins and, and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified, but only if you obey it. Only if you obey the teachings of Jesus Christ can you have eternal life. And then, once you've obeyed the gospel, you need to continue to live according to the gospel. You have to live faithfully thereafter. You have to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Listen to what it is that James says in James 1, beginning at verse 22. He says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. He observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Are we doers of the word, or are we hearers only? Here James describes 
the word of God as a mirror. He, he, he uses the illustration of a mirror. What do we use mirrors for? Generally speaking, we use mirrors. We look in a mirror to uh, see what needs corrected. We look in a mirror in the morning to see if our hair uh, looks correct. I, I don't have that problem. That's not an issue for me. But I do look in the mirror in the morning to shave. And we see our imperfections when we look in a mirror. And we can take corrective steps as much as possible. It depends on what you have to work with, I know. But, you know, we can correct our imperfections. You can, you can comb your hair. You can shave your face. But um, the Bible is described as a mirror. When we look into the Bible, we, we see our imperfections. We see the things that need to be corrected in our lives. But, friend, it's not enough just to see it. We have to do it. And that means we have to make that correction. We have to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Uh, the passage says, you know, the one who's a, who's a hearer only, he observes his face in the mirror and he walks away and forgets what manner of man he was. In other words, no correction has taken place. But the one who looks into the law of liberty and who makes the correction in their life that needs to be made, where we read that that one will be blessed in what he does. We have to continue to live faithfully. We have to walk in the light in order for the blood of Jesus to continue to cleanse us of our sins after we've initially obeyed the gospel. In 1 John 1 and verse 7, John writes, If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. I love the, the King James Version of the Bible in that sometimes it applies the TH, E-T-H, on the end of a word. And uh, in this passage... Uh, the King James reads, The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sins. The ETH on the end of a word, it denotes the fact that in the original Greek language, it's a verb that means it cleanses and it continues to cleanse. We can be thankful and grateful that if we continue to walk in the light, if we continue to obey the teachings of Jesus to the best of our ability, His blood will continue to cleanse us of our sins. We we don't need to be baptized every time we commit a sin because the blood of Jesus then washes our sins away at that point, from that point on, um, by our obedience and walking in the light. But if we cease to walk in the light, that blood will no longer cleanse us of our sins. So we have to continue to live it. We have to live it in obedience to the gospel. We have to live it uh, then, then on for the rest of our lives in order to have the salvation that is offered therein. And as we conclude, part of living it is spreading it, teaching it to others. In 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2, the Apostle Paul told the young preacher Timothy, the things which you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. The things that we've learned, we are to commit to other people that they might learn the truth and then eventually be able to pass on what they have learned to others also. We, friend, we have a wonderful blessing in God's word and it can do so much for us. Our responsibility is to love it, to learn it, and to live it. Have a good day and thank you for listening. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there and sadly so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map don't even open their Bibles yet and they think they're saved already. As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, it has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion, or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people, 
or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And that, the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. We need to keep in mind, too, that in Noah's day, there was a big flood, and only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the roadmap to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey. Thank you.